Welcome to week six. <laughs> That's the last time I try to pop up into the screen from the bottom. And no, I didn't do that on purpose. So last week we started going through the U.S. Constitution. We started off with Article 1. And Article 1 talks about the legislative branch, which is Congress. And Congress is made up of two chambers, the House and the Senate. And we talked about how both of those chambers work, how a bill becomes a law, all that good stuff. Article 1 of the Constitution is pretty big. So this week we're going to wrap up with Article 1 by taking a closer look at some of those powers that the legislative branch has. Let's get started. running out of ideas for intros. So as I said, the next section of the Constitution we're going to get into is Article 1, Section 8, which is arguably one of the most important parts of the U.S. Constitution because this lists the powers of Congress. And there's a lot of debate over what these words and these clauses in the Constitution actually mean. First of all, I recommend that you get out your pocket Constitution you got this year and follow along with me as I go through Article 1, Section 8. As you read through the articles in the Constitution, you'll see they're divided up into sections. And those sections are divided up into clauses. And a clause is just kind of like a new paragraph that signifies that this particular paragraph is about something. So when I say clause, I'm talking about a certain paragraph within a section, which is within an article. Make sense? Okay. So let's jump right into Article 1, Section 8. It starts by saying the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, <laughs> duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. So remember, under the Articles of Confederation, the federal government did not have the power to raise taxes. But now this new central government does have the power to. Patrick, that's my money. Have you learned nothing about sharing? And also notice it says imposts and excises, that's tariffs, shall be uniform throughout the United States. Remember I had talked about Shays' Rebellion and how the states would put a bunch of different tariffs on each other in a trade war and how that wasn't good for the economy. Well, now this makes it to where all tariffs have to be uniform and the same throughout the United States. Then it goes on to say that the United States has the power to borrow money on the credit of the United States. That means we can borrow money from other countries, which was a power under the Articles of Confederation, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. All right, stop right there. This clause of the Constitution is super important. Hey, did you know that the Commerce Clause of the Constitution- Okay, I'm not doing that again this week. I trust you guys heard me the first time. All right, first things first, let's define what the word commerce actually means. A simple Google search will show that the definition is the activity of buying and selling, especially on a large scale. Okay, so that's kind of referring to economics, buying and selling. So it says Congress can regulate commerce with foreign nations. That means other countries. It means we can put tariffs on Chinese made goods, or we can stop a certain import from coming in from Mexico, perhaps. Then it says, and among the several states. So that means in between the states. It's sometimes referred to as interstate. That prefix inter means between the states and with the Indian tribes. Now, that's pretty important because it means if a good is created in one state and sold in another state or bought in another state, then Congress has the ability to pass a law to regulate it in some sort of way. Maybe Congress decides to put a tax on that product, or maybe they force that product to put its active ingredients on the back of it, like with this cleaning solution, or to put a warning on it. Like on this hand sanitizer here, Congress literally passed a law that forces them to put a warning on there not to eat the hand sanitizer. It might seem like common sense, but after seeing your generation in the Tide Pod Eating Challenge, you can see why some in Congress want to keep those warnings on there. Now, hopefully after learning about the Articles of Confederation and Shays' Rebellion, you kind of see the intention behind giving the central government the power to regulate products going in between states after all the crazy trade wars that occurred under the Articles of Confederation between the states. A lot, not all of the framers, wanted to give this commerce power to the federal government to create almost like a big free trade zone in the United States between the states. They figured making a free trade zone where there weren't a bunch of tariffs 
tariffs between the states and all of that would mean that the economy in the United States would grow. But there were some at the Constitutional Convention that worried this Commerce Clause was too broad. It was too vague. And therefore, it would give Congress way too much power. And you know what? They weren't wrong. The Commerce Clause has gone from meaning that Congress can regulate products that go only in between states to now meaning Congress can even regulate products that never leave a state. That means if I milked a cow in my backyard and I wanted to sell the raw milk to my buddy Joe just down the street, the federal government would have legal standing to step in and regulate that sale. They might tell me I have to put certain labels on it. They might put a tax on me. They might tell me I have to sell it at a certain price. That's a lot of power for the national government to have. In fact, let me give you a more recent example of a case where the Supreme Court allowed Congress to use the Commerce Clause to justify an increase in power. So once upon a time, not so long ago, there were two women that lived in California and they had some severe health problems. So they went to the doctor who prescribed them medicinal marijuana to help with their problems. Now, under California state law at the time, that was perfectly legal. Under the Compassionate Use Act of 1996, doctors could prescribe medicinal marijuana if it was appropriate to treat certain conditions that patients might have. So both of these women were actually allowed to grow the marijuana in their backyard for their own purposes. All was well and fun until one day, the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency busted down the door and destroyed all of their marijuana plants. They were like, what the heck? This is legal under California law. The DEA said, ha, not so fast. Under federal law, under the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, it's illegal. So here we have a case where state law is saying the exact opposite of federal law. Who's going to win out in this case? Well, this is why we have a Supreme Court to decide those types of controversies. So in the Supreme Court case, Gonzalez versus Reich, the Supreme Court sided with the federal government and said it was perfectly legal for them to destroy the marijuana plants. Why? Well, the federal government argued that they had the right to destroy the marijuana plants because of the Commerce Clause. They might be thinking, wait a second, Mr. Lucas, those marijuana plants and that weed never left the state of California. It was an interstate commerce. So how could Congress regulate something that stayed within a state? The argument was that by keeping medicinal marijuana growing in their backyard, they were affecting the market for marijuana in the whole entire country. Yeah, so by her growing it herself and not buying it from someone else, she was affecting the supply and demand. And if you remember from basic economics, whenever you affect the supply and demand, you also affect the price. Yes, wrap your head around that. By them growing it in their backyard, that means they weren't buying it from drug dealers, which affected the supply and demand, which affected the price that drug dealers would have to offer other people. So the federal government said, hey, it may not be legal and it may just be within the state of California, but her actions are affecting interstate commerce, which means we can step in under the Commerce Clause and justify our actions. The Supreme Court bought the argument and in a six to three decision, they basically told the two ladies, stay off the weed. So you can see why there were a lot of arguments over the Commerce Clause, because a lot of people rightly predicted that Congress would use the Commerce Clause to increase their power over the states and over us as people. To people like Thomas Jefferson and Sam Adams, who feared a strong central government and wanted the states to have more power, like it was under the Articles of Confederation, this Commerce Clause terrified them for that very reason. The people that wrote and defended the Commerce Clause said, hey, you guys saw what it was like when we didn't have a Commerce Clause and the central government didn't have this power under the Articles of Confederation. We all know how that turned out. So let's give it a try. So moving on with Article 1, Section 8. The next part says to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. That means the rules for people becoming citizens or a part of the United States and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States to coin money, regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin and fix the standard of weights and measures. So to coin money means the federal government could create a mint that could go strike metals and actually create coins. And then they could determine what the value of those coins would be. Later on, this included paper money as well. Obviously, since the federal government under the Constitution has the power to regulate the value of money, they also have the power to punish people that may counterfeit that money in the United States. And again, if you don't know what counterfeiting is, it's where people try to print their own money and pass it off as real money. 
Under the Constitution, Congress also has the ability to establish post offices and post roads, which still exist to this day. The United States Postal Service is actually an example of a government-run monopoly. Yes, there's FedEx and UPS and Amazon that can deliver packages, but when it comes to mailing a letter, the USPS has the sole responsibility for that. Congress also has the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. That means if you make a discovery or you make a song, you get the credit for that creation. No one can steal it and claim it was theirs and get credit and money for that. That's why you'll see on a lot of logos that little C, which means copyright, or a TM, which means trademark, or an R, which means restricted. And a lot of times, even on music, you'll see that a lot of musicians will publish their songs with the copyright office. All of those signs mean that Congress has officially recognize that that is their intellectual property and no one can steal it from them and take credit for it and make money off of it. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution also says that Congress has the power to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. That means to create courts under the Supreme Court. They also have the power to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. So yeah, that literally means that they can capture and punish pirates. Congress also has the power to declare war, which we'll talk about at the end of this video, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. To raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. Remember, under the Articles of Confederation, Congress had to ask the states for troops. Now this is allowing Congress to have a standing army for the federal government, and Congress can decide how much money they get. Congress gets to decide what rules and regulations the Army and Navy have to follow, what types of weapons they can use, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can see the next clause there says to provide and maintain a Navy. At the very beginning of our nation, we only had an Army and a Navy, and the other branches of the military were added on over time. The next part there talks about Congress having some power over the state militias. And a state militia was basically almost like a state army of your common everyday person who had a gun that was able to be called up if the state was ever threatened. This is allowing Congress at least some power over those state militias. Now let's skip down to that last part there. To make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or office thereof. This is called the Necessary and Proper Clause, and it's also really important up there with the Commerce Clause. So let's read it again. To make all laws which shall be necessary and proper. That means for some reason you need to make a law. And then it says proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. That word foregoing means the powers just previously listed before that. So basically it's saying if you need to make an additional law that's not necessarily mentioned in here to carry out one of the powers that we just mentioned, you can do that under this clause of the Constitution. Still confused? Let me give you an example. You see in Article 1, Section 8, it says Congress has the power to maintain a Navy, but it doesn't say anything in there about Congress having the power to purchase a new aircraft carrier for the Navy. But in today's day and age, it's kind of necessary and proper if you're going to have a Navy to also have an aircraft carrier. So if Congress passes a law purchasing a new aircraft carrier for the Navy, they can point to the necessary and proper clause and say, hey, we have the power to pass this law to buy a new aircraft carrier for the Navy because it's necessary and proper to maintain a Navy. And that's what makes it constitutional. Otherwise, if that necessary and proper clause wasn't in there, there might be someone or quite a few people that say, wait a second, you don't have the power to buy a new aircraft carrier. That's not mentioned in the Constitution as one of your powers. The necessary and proper clause is sometimes referred to as the elastic clause. And that word elastic is just basically a fancy word for flexible. The illustration for the necessary and proper clause, aka the elastic clause, is a rubber band, which can be pulled out and stretched. And just like with a rubber band, Congress can use the necessary and proper clause to kind of have more flexibility and stretch their powers out. Now, here's an even more recent example of the necessary and proper clause in action. Recently, Congress added a new branch of the military, the Space Force. Obviously, in Article 1, Section 8 there, it says nothing about Congress having the power to create a Space Force. 
But it does say that Congress can create and maintain an army and a navy for the purpose of protecting the nation. Now, since creating a space force is consistent with the intentions of maintaining an army and a navy and protecting the common defense of the nation, Congress was able to create the space force, this new branch of the military, and say it was constitutional using the necessary and proper clause. The argument was a space force is necessary and proper for us to defend the nation. So to summarize everything that you just learned about here in Article 1, Section 8, all of these powers that you see here, these are called expressed powers or enumerated powers because they're actually written in the document itself. This last clause, the necessary and proper clause there in Article 1, Section 8, is where Congress gets its implied powers, meaning that they're not actually written there. They're just kind of implied that Congress can purchase an aircraft carrier or make a new branch of the military. So the difference between enumerated slash express powers and implied powers is the same difference between a do not enter sign, where it clearly says in writing, do not enter, and a fence, where it may not specifically say do not enter, but the fact that a fence is there kind of implies that you shouldn't cross that boundary. And there you have it. That, in a brief nutshell, is Congress's powers. As you can see, there's a lot in there, but there was one part in particular, the father of the Constitution, Lil Jimmy himself, thought was the wisest part of the Constitution. James Madison said, in no part of the Constitution is more wisdom to be found than in the clause which confides the question of war or peace to the legislature and not to the executive department. What is he saying there? He thinks the best part of the entire constitution is the fact that they allow Congress to be the ones to declare war instead of the president alone. Now let's stop and think for a second. What does that word declare actually mean? I didn't say it, I declared it. I mean, after all, if someone attacks you or you decide to bomb someone, is that not in effect declaring war on them through action, even though it's not through an official written word? I mean, if someone just walked up to you and punched you in the face, you would probably assume that you're at war. Well, according to the U.S. Constitution, if the United States wants to declare war on someone, they have to pass it by a simple majority vote in both the House and the Senate. After it passes both the House House and the Senate, it then goes on for the president to sign or reject, just like any other bill would. You would hope that the president would be on board with declaring war because, as we'll learn in Article 2, the president's in charge of the military. He's the commander in chief, which means he's in charge of all the weapons and soldiers. Now, the founders knew from history that the executive branch, you know, the ones with all the guns that can actually force people to follow the law and is in charge of the military, would be the most prone to want to use that violence. James Madison said the Constitution supposes what the history of all governments demonstrates, that the executive is the branch of power most interested in war and most prone to it. Therefore, such big decisions that are going to result in lives lost and altered forever should be carefully deliberated on by the representatives of the people who will bear the brunt of the war itself. After all, shouldn't you have a say through your elected representatives on if you, your family, or your friends are sent to die in a war? Not to mention all the economic costs that come with war, with higher prices, higher taxes, and even rationing certain goods. Otherwise, if the person making the decision on a war doesn't have to bear the same costs and sacrifices as the people, they're more likely to say something like, Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. It's a heck of a lot easier to send someone else's son or daughter to go fight and die in a war than it is to send your own son or daughter. It forces you to carefully consider the question, is it worth it? And this is exactly why they wanted to give this power to Congress, the part of government that's closer to the people, that more closely represents the people. Now, the United States hasn't officially declared war on anyone since World War II. I ask that the Congress declare a state of war. Yet since then, we've been at war with Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and various terrorist organizations. In fact, the United States has only officially declared war five times. The War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, and World War II. I'm sure you remember learning in history class about other conflicts the United States has fought in as well, too. For example, against the Native Americans, against the Philippines. Oh yeah, what about the Civil War, too? So why did Congress declare war in some cases, but not in others? It's pretty complex, but there are some guidelines that can help us figure it out. First, we need to actually realize there's technically two things Congress can do when it comes to conflict. They can declare war, or they can authorize the use of military force. So for Congress to declare war, it has to meet 
a few criteria. For there to be a declaration of war, it has to be against a recognized sovereign foreign country, a country that's actually on the map. That means Native American tribes, terrorist organizations, and oh yeah, states that decide to secede and form their own nation that the president refuses to recognize. All of those fail to meet this first benchmark. So it has to be against an actual country. Secondly, it can't be a limited war. This means that the war is big. It's on a grand scale. It's not limited in its size, its scope, and its objectives. Authorizations for war are more limited in their size and scope, and they're often called limited war. So maybe instead of conquering an entire nation, you just want to kill the terrorist leader that's been harassing your troops in a certain region that's hiding out in the mountains somewhere. Again, this is usually against non-nations, so maybe a group of rebels or a pirate or terrorists. The concept of limited wars is kind of hard and confusing to define. What starts off as a limited war might grow into a much bigger conflict. Then there's the issue of attacking someone versus being attacked by someone. Now, if the United States decides to attack someone completely unprovoked, Provoked, then yes, they for sure need a declaration of war. But do you need a declaration of war or even congressional authorization for the use of military force for self-defense? This is where people disagree. In fact, even the Founding Fathers disagreed on this when they were writing this into the Constitution. Now, the Founding Fathers did agree that the president should have the power to repel sudden attacks. Because, I mean, after all, if an invading army is coming to take you over, you may not have time to necessarily go to Congress, get them all together, have them debate and vote on you being able to use military force to defend the nation. As you'll learn this year, Congress is very slow to act on anything. In an era where nuclear weapons can be fired and hit a target halfway across the world really quickly, it places an even heavier emphasis on one person being able to make a quick decision. You wouldn't want to have a nuke incoming and then be forced to get Congress together so they could debate and vote on if we were going to try to defend ourselves. Hence why the president always has access to the nuclear buttons, which is also kind of terrifying to think that one person has so much power. Now, this gets tricky. What if you have evidence from your spies that your enemy is about to strike you, so you strike them first before they can hit you? Is that considered an offensive strike or a defensive strike? Such a strike like that is often referred to as a preemptive strike. That means you're hitting your enemy before they can hit you. The difficulty here lies in trying to figure out if a war is defensive or offensive, and that really depends on your perspective of the conflict and which side you're on. Imagine two kids get in a fight and get sent down to the principal's office. What's the the first thing that each of them say. He started, he started it. Two of our earliest presidents, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, both got put to the test early on in their presidencies, and they kind of showed us how they interpreted the War Powers Clause. Both of their presidencies saw American sailors being attacked or harassed. In John Adams' case, it was the French harassing American shipping headed to England, and in Thomas Jefferson's case, it was the Barbary pirates off the coast of Libya that were kidnapping and attacking American sailors. Now, as the commander-in-chief and head of the military, both presidents told the sailors that they could defend themselves and fight back if they were attacked. In in both cases, Adams and Jefferson went to Congress as soon as they could to ask for Congress to authorize the use of military force to deal with these threats. And sure enough, both times Congress did grant the use of military force with an authorization for the use of military force. In John Adams's case, he was fighting a limited war against the nation of France for the sole purpose of trying to protect American shipping. He wasn't trying to conquer France, so he didn't need a declaration of war. It's not too dissimilar from a situation President Trump is dealing with currently with Iran. In Jefferson's case, he was fighting a limited war and a war against a non-nation which is again why he didn't need a declaration of war and just needed an authorization for the use of military force from Congress. Jefferson even landed troops on Libya's shore to go after the leader of the Barbary pirates. In fact, this is referenced in the Marine Battle Hymn. To the shores of Tripoli. When this was challenged and brought to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court ruled that Congress and the president were well within their constitutional powers to authorize a limited war. That means when it came to Korea and Vietnam, the presidents then tried to justify their actions by saying it was a limited war and it was against non-nation states. Therefore, they didn't need Congress. But some in Congress were like, hold up, hold up, you still need us. The final straw came during the Vietnam War when President Nixon began secretly bombing Cambodia to disrupt Viet Cong supply routes which were going around U 
U.S. forces. The thing is, he never told Congress about it. Congress was not too happy and ended up passing the War Powers Act of 1973, which seeks to take back some of that power away from the president and give it back to Congress to kind of restore checks and balances. It works like this. If the president engages the U.S. military in a new fight, he has to notify Congress within 48 hours of the military taking that new action. The War Powers Act then prohibits U.S. forces from staying locked into combat in that area for more than 60 days with a 30-day withdrawal period unless Congress passes an authorization for the use of military force or a declaration of war. Obviously, President Nixon wasn't a big fan of this and vetoed it, but Congress said, you know what, Nixon, go kick rocks. And as we learned last week, one of Congress's checks on the presidency is that they can override a president's veto by a two-thirds majority in both the House and the Senate, and that's exactly what they did. Checkmate, son. So here's your assignments for this week. Obviously, you have this Ed Puzzle and another Ed Puzzle, both of which are due on Wednesday. Then you have a critical thinking question assignment that's due Thursday. That's right. We're back to the CTQs. This week's CTQ is asking you to take a look at a more recent event and controversy surrounding war powers between President Trump and Congress. Many of you might remember this. King news from the Middle East, where a U.S. drone strike killed one of Iran's most powerful military leaders overnight. The targeted killing of Major General Qasem Soleimani. Remember all the great World War III memes that came out of that? Ah, that's right. Back in the days when we thought narrowly avoiding World War III would have been the craziest thing to happen in 2020. In case you weren't paying attention back then, here's what happened. Iran's top general, a guy by the name of Qasem Soleimani, was working with terrorist organizations stationed in the Middle East to attack American troops. Soleimani was a bad dude and helped a lot of terrorist organizations kill American soldiers in Iraq. U.S. intelligence got word that Soleimani was planning another attack on American troops. Once President Trump was told, as commander-in-chief, he ordered for the assassination of Soleimani via drone strike. And sure enough, when the timing was right, Soleimani was in his vehicle and an American drone destroyed his caravan. Iran immediately retaliated and fired rockets at U.S. troops stationed in Iraq. Some soldiers received severe brain damage from the attacks. After Soleimani's assassination, Congress got really upset with President Trump because he did not ask them for authorization to use the military strike against Soleimani. From Congress's perspective, assassinating another country's top general is pretty close to a declaration of war. I mean, can you imagine if China or Russia assassinated our top general in the United States? We'd probably view that as a declaration of war, too. Congress felt this defeated the whole purpose of checks and balances when it came to war powers because President Trump could have started World War III and never consulted the people's representatives in Congress. President Trump argued that the action was in self-defense and that there was an imminent attack that could have hit American soldiers in Iraq. Therefore, he argued he didn't need Congress's authorization to defend American lives. But Congress fought back and said, hey, if you've known that this guy is a threat to our national security for a while, you could have asked us for an authorization for the use of military force a while back and then used it whenever you deem necessary. But President Trump claimed that he didn't need that because according to the authorization for the use of military force in 2001, Congress had authorized the president to use the military against terrorist groups that had helped in the 9-11 attacks and anyone that helped those terrorist groups. And President Trump was arguing that the Iranian general was helping those terrorist groups. And so this age-old debate about who should have the power to declare war or authorize the use of military force, be it the president, or Congress raged on again. So in your CTQ this week, on that first slide, I have a plethora of resources from both sides of this issue. Take a look at both sides. Get familiar with the arguments on both sides. And then again, just like last time, choose which side you agree with and then counter argue against the challenges to your position in there. Again, you only have to do one slide. Now, you do not need to cite and quote the resources and articles that I gave you. Those are just there to help you formulate your argument and help you figure out which side you agree with. I want this to be more like a conversation you're having with a friend. So please, do not copy and paste out of those articles into your slide. I don't care what they think. I care more about how you would respond to those challenges to your position. I also want to mention that this Tuesday, September 29th at 9 p.m. is the first presidential debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And I will be going live to answer any questions, to kind of comment on everything that's going on there. So if you want to follow me on Instagram or Twitter, I'll go live. Who knows? Maybe the Iran controversy will pop up. 
Lastly, I've decided to post some extra credit opportunities in Google Classroom. These are under elite level controversies. They're Google Doc assignments. You open those up, read the instructions in there, and if you do well enough on each one, you can earn up to five bonus points per elite level controversy that you do. That'll do it for this week. As always, if you need anything, let me know. Have an awesome week.